everyone and welcome to today's webinar, International Women's Day, Celebrating Women in Food Service. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Emma Gill. I work for Unilever and part of my role is um, driving awareness of Fair Kitchens, which is a global movement fighting for a more resilient and sustainable food service industry. I want to say a big thank you to Breaks, who are our co-hosts for this webinar today and to our fantastic panel of speakers. The next 35 minutes or so will consist of a pre-recorded panel discussion, followed by a live Q&A and some downloadable resources at the end. We'd really love to hear from you. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please drop them in the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. I know if you'll bear with me for one second, I'm going to play the video and I'll see you afterwards. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, webinar celebrating women in food service. As far as International Women's Day, we want to take the opportunity to shine a light on some of the experiences of some of the great women in our industry. We know that food service continues to be a male dominated profession, and in 2017, the Office of National Statistics reported that just 17% of chefs were women. The stat which is shocking, but actually possibly not surprising in this industry. My name is Cathy Amos and I'm the Customer Marketing for, Manager for Breaks and I look after everything to do with the public sector, contract catering and care. Now I'm joined by a fantastic panel of women, all at various stages in their food service career. From those that are starting out on their journey, like Megan, to those that are more seasoned pros and have been in the industry for quite some time, like myself. Over the next 45 minutes or so, we will hear their stories, advice and hopes for the industry going forward. While we will discuss some of the barriers and bias that women face, we will also celebrate their many achievements and discuss their visions for the future. There will be time for questions at the end, and if you have any questions for any of our panellists, then please do feel free to drop it in the chat bar at the end and we will do our best to get round to it. So now our panellists, I'm joined by Zoe Gill, Sector Development Chef at Breaks, Kath Beckton, Training and Development Chef for North Yorkshire County Council, Valerie Perry, teacher at Tower Sixth Form in Ashford, Megan Spencer, who's a student at Tower Sixth Form and also works part-time at Dobby's Garden Centre, and Kyla Towie, who is the corporate chef for Unilever Food Solutions Canada. So firstly, thank you to everybody for taking the time to join us this afternoon. So I'm going to ask a few people the questions to start with and uh, we'll take it from there. So if I'd like to start with, um, how did you start your journey in the industry, Zoe? My journey, well, believe it or not, my journey started from the age of four. My parents set up their first food business with a bakery and tea room. And as that progressed, that then moved into a hotel and restaurant. And then from there to um, a delicatessen. And after the journey of their, their businesses, my mum then moved into um, catering college lecturing. So really, I just feel that food and the industries been very much part of within my blood and my DNA. Brilliant. And Kath, what about your journey? I started in catering, obviously, like a lot of young people as a Saturday weekend holiday job, starting in cafes, going to pubs, going to hotels. So then I went on to catering college and trained for three years. From catering college, on um, where I was at catering college, we went to work out in France, I went to work in Scotland, and then I went into the hot to work in hotels. So that's how I started on my journey in, in catering. So you've certainly been able to travel with the catering industry. And Val, how did you get into teaching? Obviously, you've started in catering. How did you start and, and end up in teaching? Um, I had an accident and decided <laughs> to go and go along to the local college open day. Um, actually, to, I fancied a change into carpentry walked into the wrong room and felt so embarrassed about walking out saying sorry I'm, I shouldn't be here it's not where I want to be I just sat there quietly and listened and at the end of it I was approached by um, Dr Anna Sloman Gower who said I feel that perhaps teaching would be good for you and you you seem very calm so I followed her advice and ended up going to 
the local university and doing my teach training um, and one day a week at South Kent College teaching which was quite scary to start with and realized that perhaps I should have always done this because I thoroughly enjoyed it and felt that I was giving back something to the industry that they'd given to me because I enjoyed it so much. That's brilliant and maybe not quite the way that people would always start their journey but that's fantastic and I do also know that that's how Zoe first met you by being a lecturer so that, that that's fantastic um, and obviously Zoe's had a career in the industry out of first being trained by yourself which is lovely. Yeah. So um, so when I, uh, the next sort of question I was going to ask is what what were your preconceptions of the industry both in general um, and, and sort of women within it so again if I ask you that Zoe preconceptions because I was my childhood was the industry um, I could very clearly recognize that both my mum and dad on a daily basis it would be 20 hour days and being self-employed at a very difficult time in the 80s it was their business they didn't have a entourage of, of staff behind them and supporting them it was it was for them and their world so I think probably the preconception of coming into the industry, I knew it was damn hard and that the hours were long and that you only got out what you put in. Um, in terms of women within the industry, because that was the career path that my mum went along, I'd never considered to myself the issues that could come from being a woman in the industry being brought up in 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 this world it was very much second nature to me so even very early on in my college days it was never something I truly considered because that was the environment that I grew up and I learned from so yeah so you you sort of almost knew nothing of it now well, Megan can I can I ask uh, yourself now um, if you want to introduce yourself but you're relatively new to starting out in the industry obviously through training at college but also for your part-time job so when you sort of set out on this journey do you um feel there's any challenges or or barriers to what you're doing and sort of listening to the other people to a certain extent yeah and what sort of difficulties do you think there are and or, or are there more because that you're a female or, or any other reasons do you think there's any challenges yeah i just i just think it's very like very much led by men in this industry and where i work there's a lot of male staff members and etc and it's very difficult so it's quite noticeable. You can see that already quite early on that you're you're working in the industry and, and it's a lot more male dominated than it is female. So uh, it hasn't it hasn't changed really, has it? So when I sort of talk about barriers, um, so Kath, have you, would you say you've experienced any barriers in your career, um, particularly that you feel are gender biased? Massively, massively. When I've worked it in the in the private sector, obviously in the many moons ago when I was in the private sector it was again a very male dominated area when I actually worked in France I wasn't allowed to work in the kitchen the same day as the head chef I had to go in the kitchen on his days off and then when like later on in my career before obviously I cha changed to the um, public sector um, I worked with various gentlemen from around the from around the world and some of their attitudes towards females in the kitchen wasn't wasn't the best I certainly had to stand my ground. I found that they were trying to give me easier jobs, which I'm more than capable of doing. You know, I'd try to lick a, lift up a sack of potatoes and be like, no, 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 we'll do it. It's like, why? Why are you wanting to do it for me? I couldn't quite do it myself. Um, but yeah, we certainly did have them barriers. And I used to run a very successful kitchen. And the gentleman who worked my days off was a male. And I used to find that I used to leave him totally stocked up, my kitchen absolutely immaculate, and I come back in after my days off, having to restart again because he'd used everything and left me nothing. So yeah, <laughs> massive, bar massive barriers. Um, and Kyla, it's great that we've got on you. You're here and joining us, and you're obviously in Canada. So you've heard a few people talk so far. Love your sort of experience as being famous in the industry, and also being in a different country. Um, how does it feel, sort of feel for you, and, and what have your experiences been? 
Well, I really didn't know what to expect of the industry when I joined it. Um, just because my background had been quite different. I had actually already gone to university and gotten a degree in something completely different. Um, and I just love to cook. So for me, I didn't know where this would take me. I didn't know what my pathway would be. And then I started working in restaurants and it's it's a lot of the same. Like Kath just said, it's. I was given kind of menial jobs at first, which is fair because I was starting out, but I, I noticed that others that had joined at the same time of me as me, my male counterparts, uh, got more valuable jobs quicker and moved ahead quicker than I did. And then I was also given a huge workload. So I was working garde manger and pastry and then saute and grill, and I felt like I had to. I felt like I had to take it all on because I had to prove myself. And if I complained, then I'd be singled out. And for a long time, I was the only woman that was working in that kitchen. So you always so, felt you had to prove yourself more than your male counterpart. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the same or similar experiences over here <laughs> across the pond <laughs> and do you feel that you're still viewed differently now or have things have things improved or does your role make a difference it's significantly different now for me in my current role so i'm of course working with unilever food solutions um i am on the corporate side when i started with the company 15 years ago it was very much the same mentality that i had experienced in the restaurant yeah. um and that thankfully has changed. I'm very grateful that I work for a very progressive company and they value elevating females into leadership roles. And that changed how I was viewed, how I was treated. Um, and also the perception of the customers that I work with that are currently working in restaurants. That has changed as well, that has evolved. So I, I, I feel very lucky, but I know that a lot of these barriers still exist for women that are working in restaurants now. Yeah. And Megan, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but do you feel that it's slightly harder for you? Do you feel you have to work harder to prove yourself or, or can you just be yourself when you're working? Well, before I worked in Dobby's, I worked in a pub and a yeah. like, restaurant and the head chef was a, a, a manager in there and he was quite a very like, I'm the head, listen to me type of thing and would give me all of the little nitty gritty jobs of doing the bins and pot wash and he used to make me go downstairs and get all of his sauces and stuff from the basement like it was very much a bit one-sided um i'm going to sort of uh sort of go on to sort of some of the other areas here now and so you know this for some women with the industry, but obviously not anybody talking about motherhood. And I'm, I'm mindful here when we say this, that actually you almost, we don't want to be treated differently because we are a mother or should be a mother. And actually being realistic that actually for not everybody in the industry, they are a mother. So we need to look at how people are judged for the individual persons that they are um, and not, don't have exceptions made. And actually, and, and I know Zoe, you're quite passionate about this, um, as a as a woman, do you feel that um, it's made a difference to you how you've been treated as in your instance, a woman and a mother? Um, do, you, do you feel that's made any difference to you? Um, I think that with with anything like this, what you really need at the root to give you the structure and the support mechanism is the right people to work with the right leadership, the right line managers. And I'm really fortunate and Kathy is my line manager. <laughs> and both being mothers, we can both relate. And I think that if you being the mother within the home role, it just brings you so many skills within the working environment. So I've had um, members of staff that have reported into me and I think it's really essential in the fact that being that mother you can then be able to empathize with them show them compassion when when times are difficult so whether or not all of a sudden out the blue the children have gone poorly how am I going to juggle work and dealing with the phone call from the school to collect them or juggling work and a happy medium of school assemblies so I think motherhood brings you a a lot 
of um, experience within the industry, but also in the fact that for students like Megan, Megan, I just want to wrap you up and type of bring you home and wrap you and put you under my wing. And I think there's that other nurturing side. So very much within Val's position of her role, it is about nurturing and seeing students like Megan flourish. So I think motherhood just brings so many different skills from from home into the workplace. Thank you. And Kath, what's it been like for you? I think um, your journey, I think it's, I think you've said to me when we were chatting before that it's when you had family that it took you to the next stage of what you were going to do in your career, actually. Yeah, totally. Um, obviously, when I worked in the private sector, my last job, I had a, a very sympathetic boss. He was really good. And on more than one occasion, he actually had to pick my children up from school and, and the nursery for me because the guys had been out, had a bit of a heavy drinking session, didn't turn up for work, and guess who had to cover? Yeah. So, you know, I had a very sympathetic boss. I always remember one New Year's Eve, I was on at the hot plate, and this lady complained because there was children sat on the end of her table. Those children were my children with my husband and my mum. And my boss overheard her and he just tapped her on the shoulder and he actually said, do you see the lady behind the hot plate and he said and she said yes and he, she said he said well with her out without her being stood at that hot plate cooking your meal you wouldn't be here because they had her children and just walked off so i had a very kind of support it, it, it kind of worked both ways so obviously as my children got a little bit older i was losing childcare. and then the job came up in a school you know to work in the in the public sector I took the job and you know it changed my life it sure it changed everything i could then put my children to bed i didn't expect anybody to look after them during holidays the only time i did have an issue obviously was if my children were ill but then i obviously found very willing grandparents because i wasn't asking them all the time to have my children <laughs> because I could be home for them. So for me, it was a total, everything evened up. And I always remember the first Christmas that I was ever off, I found it really strange because I was wondering what I, what I then could do because I had nothing to do during that time. And normally I'd get flat out cooking everybody's festivities and, and such. So yeah, it was such a positive change for me. I think that's really I think one of the things we should remember when we're looking at an area like that, that's a that situation going on. Um, and there are a lot to leave that to a child or to get to show, but to rely on the one person. So, so while we're talking here, it's always talking about child care and the mother, if you like. Whatever a child's situation is, if there's two people involved, then employers really consider that it isn't always one person's responsibility. Two people should, should share the responsibility of going somewhere to the dentist or finishing early or whatever that might be. And I really think that employers need to make sure they consider that, that there are two people quite often, for if, if there is a situation where childcare is considered it shouldn't rely on just the one normally woman doing that. And I think that's just something that people need to consider more going forward. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit now about recognition as success. So I, I, you know, I know there's 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 so many great things around this table, and we're all doing different roles here. But um, largely, I'll start with Kath because I met Kath actually through Lacer and the school meals um, back in I think it was 2016 when mm -hmm. you were what you'd buy South Forward uh, in a, an amazing competition that schools do, that they do for the school chef of the year. So can you tell us a little bit about that, Kath? Yeah, so obviously the competition itself is a bit like Ready Steady Cook. You have certain ta time length to do it. it, has to be to our nutrition, it has to be to food costs, and you have to cook and present four main courses, four desserts that are all school food compliant. So I was actually lucky to win, lucky enough to win in 2016. Bit of a shock to the system because I ended up being on the one show. So many great opportunities. Not only did I win School Chef of the Year, I also won Educator in um, Primary School Cater of the Year as well in the same year. The following year, I actually hosted that award show. <laughs> so but again, massive things that can happen. Um, I'm on a LASER committee. I've made masses of friends, not just with P 
people within the school food industry, but obviously everyone else from the, the public sector, you know, universities, hospitals, care, and and such a seamed person personnel as well within our industry. You never know what's going to happen. And one of my most memorable one, well, two of my most memorable ones was going to an award show and then drinking in Mayfair on a street with celebrity chefs. And it was a bit of a pinch yourself life moment because there was massive fast cars and it's like am I really stood here and then my next one was when I took the phone call to go to the Queen's Garden party for everything that I'd achieved within school food that just was like you never expect anything like that to happen in your lifetime so it was a total shock to the system when it did Oh, uh, and well deserved and I know when we were speaking earlier in the week about this um you know I know Megan was like wow but actually this is the start of anyone's you're on a start of a career Megan and you don't know what way I'll take it but there are so many openings there for you now that's what success looks like when you sort of achieve you know awards and stuff like that but actually success means different things to different people and you can achieve it in different ways so if I talk to you Kylie what would you what does success look for you look like for you when in in your role so I mean, in my particular role, I think you could really kind of translate that into a restaurant role because it's about being heard. Yeah. And I think it's the, it's the smaller things. And I would say the same for working in a restaurant kitchen or, or wherever you might be. It's having people recognize the work that you're doing every day, even if it's something small, even if it's just saying great job. Um, and then again, also just being heard. So being comfortable enough to to stand up for yourself, you know, having people listen to you and acknowledge how you're feeling, what you need. Um, I think those are the key indicators for success as the, it's the small things. So Zoe, what does success mean to you? I think it's just to be happy, to make people happy within food. And that doesn't matter which sector that is because we have such an opportunity to share the joy of food so whether or not that's that's little ones at nursery children within school which is cat's passion all the way through dare i say palliative care we can really make a difference and it doesn't need to be the big houses the big salaries the the most luxurious of holidays if within yourself you're happy that happiness will come through within how you succeed Lovely. And Kath, obviously, um, I'm sorry, Kath, um, Val, from your point of view with your role and working with your students, and I don't know if success is something you talk about, but what would that sort of mean to you and your students? Success from the feeling of having been successful for me is having those students achieve that qualification and going out into industry at the end of it and having a job that they enjoy yeah. and i so see that with the work experience they come back and they're full of it they're so excited and happy to be with people that also enjoy food and which i think food is such a great a platform for everybody to join no, nobody on this call would be in this industry if they didn't enjoy food and sharing that food brings and we're all fortunate enough to be able to share food with everybody but also from your point of view Val it must be quite nice to see somebody who's been in a career as long as Zoe still enjoying what they do yeah it is because so many people go into catering and after a few years they go oh blow that you think I'm going to work these hours for the rest of my life um, and, you, and I can't see it because I just think, well, well, why not? It's what you wanted to do at the start. What What's made you change? And actually, Megan touched on it earlier and said about working in the kitchens and there being, you know, less females in the kitchens where she's worked. With that at college, do you have to actively work harder to recruit people to do the catering courses, female, or is that quite even split to get attract people into the industry from a training point of view? It used to be an even split, but not anymore. I've got one, I've had one female student this year and she's just completed and now I don't have any. So it's, it is all males. 
which that's just interesting isn't it I wonder what you know is it the celebrity chef thing that's leading in that I, I don't know but that certainly the um, industry is short of people in general actually there's a we all know there's a shortage in the industry so it's really a question I mean what what does that I mean Kath what do you think the industry can do to attract more people and particularly women maybe can I just say after Val's last comment because obviously like she's got less females obviously the sector i work in is more female dominated but it's like on the flip side of the coin now because we actually see more males coming into school into school catering so they're seeing you know the benefits of it you know the the work-life balance so for us it's like we're seeing the more of the flip side so and i think you know, to, to succeed in catering, you have to have that passion. Like Zoe said before, you have to have it in you. You have to want to nurture. And I think being a mum in the industry is a great thing because it allows us to do this. We Part of my job role now is going in training. And I think, you know, like, nurture, again, nurturing it, it gives us an understanding when we're trying to teach people. You know, the catering industry is a great industry to be in. There's so many benefits to it, and you literally, the world is your oyster. Absolutely. And Kyla, is it the same in Canada? I mean, is there a skill shortage and a shortage of women in the industry? Absolutely. Um, it goes beyond, I think, what the pandemic has done to the industry. So we see in restaurants here, obviously, there's been a huge shortage um, of people leaving and deciding that they weren't getting paid enough <laughs> and how they were getting treated was not appropriate. And I see the same mentality of students that are thinking about going into the industry. They're aware of some of the systemic issues that exist and that not all restaurants treat their employees fairly or the same. And so a big thing with the Fair Kitchens movement is that we're trying to address that with students even before they get into the industry. These issues are definitely more important to the younger generation, or at least they're more vocal about it, mm -hmm. which I think is amazing. Um, and we just need to see this evolution of people being treated better, getting paid for the type of work that they're doing. Um, it's, it's so important and it, it is very much something that's on a global scale, I think, affecting everywhere and, and absolutely and you're on a women's leadership project aren't you as well would you budge tell I us a little bit about that am i like to call it the female think tank <laughs> so we are a group of 12 women from across north america of varying backgrounds uh cultural backgrounds work backgrounds whatever it may be um and we have been periodically coming together and trying to find a way that we can help the younger generation or even current workers, female, um, in the industry feel like they have a place to improve their working conditions, to inspire them to want to stay in the industry. Um, and these women that we're meeting with are just so inspiring and so phenomenal. Um, the thing is, what we're trying to do at this moment is really turn this into something tangible. And that's that's where the rubber's going to hit the road with this one. You know, we know that mentoring will be a big part of our solution that comes out there. So, of course, there's the awareness part, but they're sharing experiences and sharing guidance. Um, but then it's also going to be what resources are we going to have and how do we get them to the right people? So that part we're still working on, um, but it definitely is going to be a huge add to the Fair Kitchens movement. Um, I, I'm just so grateful to be able to be a part of it. And we're delighted to be part of it at breaks. And I think it's really important that, you know, we want to share this sort of thing, for example, obviously Cass here from the school's point of view, and then linking in with Val and Meg and students and teachers like that. It is how all these positive things that people are trying to do can get out there to the wider industry and how people in the wider industry can meet more people like yourselves and Kath and Zoe, people who've had 
brilliant lives and families and careers and and enjoyed what they're doing because they've worked in this industry and the two need to link in to attract more people into it, I would suggest yeah. um, because it is a great industry and I think um, like I said a lot of us we've made some good friends um, through this because we all share a passion so we all have a responsibility I think to the next generation and to support people like Megan who've been so brave to come on this call today with us which we really appreciate you know you, you've got you've got confidence and uh, um, definitely got personality for this industry uh, Meg, Megan just by wanting to be on a call like this with everybody um, that, that the career you know the world can just go further and further the strength with women in it so Val can you tell us a bit about how our businesses can help you at the colleges with your students what we actually have here at the school is a careers day and we invite businesses in to speak to the students um, so they can explain to them what type of careers they could look for. We have the armed forces, they come in with their ration packs and they actually cook it up and let the students taste it, uh, which, which is quite good fun. Um, we also actually have here work experience where we send our students out to hotels, restaurants, um, the po local police college here um, have started um, taking our students and helping with the training and it, it's working well because it does give them an insight earlier on to what they can achieve and gives them a little bit of a, more of an incentive to want I'd to, like to see some care homes do that as well it'd be lovely to see students going to care homes actually it would be but it's really difficult to get students into care homes a lot of them want to do it for the dietitian side but they just don't seem to want to take them and, and have you had any support from uh fair kitchens and breaks at your college well actually what we have on the 27th of april breaks and fair kitchens are coming into the school to do a day's seminar for the students brilliant which that i think so beneficial yeah i think it will be yeah super thank you um and kyla can i just ask you um from a fair kitchen's point of view what sort of resources and things people can access I am glad that you asked because, um, <laughs> of course, as we're also talking about women in leadership and recruitment and retention, there's a variety of different resources that are on the Fair Kitchens website. Um, in addition to that, we have a leadership training that we had actually designed that is a variety of different modules. Um, from experts within the industry that address different areas of interest that are very pertinent in having a very happy, healthy kitchen culture in your own restaurant. So it can be anything from diversity and inclusion, mental health, conflict resolution. Uh, it is absolutely free. It is a global uh, offering, <laughs> if you will. Um, so if you just go to the Fair Kitchens website, you will find it there. The other thing too, um, I'm sure I'm sure everybody's aware of the Culinary Institute of America, so very prestigious culinary school in the US. Uh, we've partnered with them on this training. So once people finish the assessment at the end, they actually get a certificate from the Culinary Institute. So it's nice that we have these partners uh, with us that see the value in helping kind of these leaders rise to their best game if you will but it's also great for people that are not currently in leadership roles to understand what it means to be a good leader so it's very exciting that we have to offer and those resources for so many um, industries that don't have their own training teams or the ability to do anything the fact that you've got those free resources for people to use is, is such an asset for many many in our world for our customers in particular and Zoe, Zoe, I'm just going to ask you to sort of summarise on this. Um, advocates, what can um, our male colleagues do to be advocates to the working woman in the kitchen? There's different elements here. Megan's touched on it earlier on at the beginning of our webinar. So just to, to understand the better way of talking to women 
And as Kath had mentioned, we don't need the menial tasks. We can most certainly lift a 25 kilo sack of potatoes and we can stand over the char grill. So there isn't anything that we can't achieve, but our male colleagues just need to work with us rather than against us. And I think there's other key points. We've touched on motherhood already today, but I think there's other areas within our life as women that change later on. So I think there is also the discussion and raising the awareness of, of that taboo subject of menopause. It affects everybody and within breaks, we're really fortunate because we have got the most fantastic support network surrounding this subject. And I think that for everybody, everybody is affected through menopause. So whether or not it's your daughter, your your son being aware, your husband, your partner. So I think within that working environment, and we all spend so much time of our, our lives within at work, that you tend to build a really good rapport and relationship. So when somebody's not quite themselves, it's as we've discussed on webinars before, it's checking in and asking the questions about how are you? Is everything OK? It might not be the most natural call to action as were, but it's being aware that actually if Zoe's getting a bit bullshit and Larry in the kitchen today, it's not because she's really cross that there could be that element, although it's a little bit too early yet, thankfully. But it's that thought process of menopause. So let's not make it a taboo subject. No, absolutely. But guys need to be aware. Yeah, super. Couldn't agree more that it actually should not be a taboo subject. It's up there with mental health. We should be talking about it. And I appreciate you saying it, Zoe. Thank you. So really, I just want to sort of summarise and say, first of all, thank you to everybody for giving up their time. Thank you for Fair Kitchens to arrange this for us. And uh, in celebration of International Women's Day, it's been a delight to speak to such inspirational women within the industry and future generations. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us. Hi everybody, welcome back to the live webinar. I hope that you all enjoyed um, a fantastic panel discussion. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to Cathy for doing such a fantastic job facilitating that session. And again, to all of our speakers, I think there was some really, um, really interesting and, and, and insightful conversation there. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes um, to cover off a bit of Q&A and I can see that there's a few in the, in the chat. So let me just have a look. And I will, I will kick right off and actually just see up at the top as well, just to say um, to everybody that um, we have recorded this event and um, we will um, be able to share out a, um, a video um, link to it after the event. So you will be able to check it out. Um, so just in terms of questions there, I've got one um, for, um, for Kyla. So, um, this uh, question says, you know, you say that there has been that you've seen improvement over the last 15 years. Um, has it been a gradual process or have you seen, you know, periods of acceleration? And, you know, what do you kind of attribute that change to? This is yeah, in terms yeah. of attitudes in the kitchen. Sorry, just that you said that you've seen improvement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, and again, I'm going to speak to the last 15 years being my job with Unilever. Um, and it was gradual. I think what really ends up making the difference is the type of people that you hire because everyone needs to be part of this inclusive team. So there's definitely setbacks. A lot of people tend to hold on to older ways of working. Um, I mean, so that's, that's what it is. It's gonna be gradual, but it's making sure that it's not just leadership that's encouraging this proper behavior. And I would say the same for the restaurant. It's the type of team that you hire. Because as long as you have everybody supporting the positive work environment, that's when you're going to see that change happen. Such a such a key point. Yeah, I think I think you see that in every kind of sector. I mean, the team and the the attitude and the other thing it affects everybody. Um, so I think that's a really good point. Thank you. Um, so a question here for Kath. Um, so Kath, you've achieved amazing things um, in your career. In, uh, in school occasion, I mean, you're very much feeding the next generation. 
Um, what are your views around culinary education in schools? So obviously for me, and I'm sure everybody on this panel would agree that cooking is a skill for life, which has sadly missed a few generations over the last few years, over the last few years. You know, lifestyles have got busier, parents have got busier, cooking hasn't been in schools for a long, long time. And obviously for me personally, like seeing teachers and teachers' assistants and the very scared of the allergens that we have to deal with day in, day out. Um, for us as a company, we have done some cookery lessons in schools. So with parents, grandparents, carers and their pupils. So we ran a 10 week course and the pupils learned loads. I saw one little boy who was adamant. He wasn't trying some food at the beginning of the course. He was like, why are you giving me such gorgeous food to taste? And then I saw him a few weeks later when we had another event on in his school and he said, I took away from your lessons what you taught me and I've tweaked it to how I like stuff in food now. So, and even the grandparents said we've learned a few things. So getting education, especially food education back in schools is a massive thing. Again, it could open up the people's love of cooking, which then could get more people back into, into our sector. I think that's such a great idea and such a such a great way to do it to have the different generations mm -hmm. so you know the grandparents the parents and again I think it's it's kind of getting everybody on board getting people on the same wavelength they, yeah. they sound like great classes they sound really good um so um question I'm hoping that we've got um Megan um on the call so someone is just saying um thanks so much for participating Megan um you're obviously at the very start of your career um do you have any idea from listening to these kind of stories? Have you have you been inspired by any of these um, kind of career paths? Do you have any idea what you might want to do next in your culinary career? Um, yeah, I love pastries and things and like pasta. So I'd either go into like the pasta side of it or I'd go into like pastries. Great stuff. Okay, that sounds really good. And actually, um, just a question for Val as well. I can only see the very perfect. I can see now, Val. Um, so someone is saying um, that it's really inspiring to see that you've kind of, um, that you've was changed career. So from being, you know, in the kitchen to being on the other side of things and teaching. Um, what advice would you give to somebody who is thinking about changing career within the industry, whether that's from kind of being a hands-on chef to teaching or, or more broadly? Coming into teaching wasn't just isn't just about teaching them to cook. It it's so much more because you're yes you're teaching them how to cook properly, how to behave in a kitchen if as it's want they want it for their career. But the biggest thing I've found is you have to care because you're not just the chef. You, you're offering careers advice. Um, you'll become a mother to some of them and you're helping them to live their, their everyday life by giving them advice, um, helping them with to set up a bank account, um, how to eat properly, um, use a fork and knife at times. So if you were thinking that by changing careers to go into teaching catering, that's where it ends. It doesn't. It's so much more. And if you're just looking at it from the holiday point of view, um, and that it may be an easier life, it isn't. It's. I've actually found it a lot harder than working in the trade. And as I've got older, I start to think, why did I jump ship? <laughs> <laughs> Is it? It is just so much more. They need, they need you to be on the ball all the time, and to be giving them advice and and help. And um, yeah, it's fun, and I thoroughly enjoy it. But it's it's not what you perceive it to be from the start. It is so much more. It's like running, um, can I say, a children's home, really, <laughs> because you have to be 
you have to have information in all fields it's not just catering mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense i think um yeah, you never really know what a role is like unless you're actually at the at the cold yeah. face and doing it it sounds like it it must be um very rewarding in the sense that you're making such a difference to to these you know kids lives it is it's rewarding in as much as when they've finished and they've gained their qualification is tracking them to see where they've gone and how they're doing and that that can be really rewarding when people say to me oh where did you do your training and who did you train under and you think yes <laughs> Well done. <laughs> They've made it. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks very much, Val. Um, I've just got one more question here um, for Zoe. Uh, so someone's saying, um, like, incredible that you've been essentially in the food service industry since you were four, although hopefully not standing at a, at a hot plate since you were that young. Um, did you always, always, always think that food service was, was going to be something you'd do or did you ever think of doing something else? Or say like now, actually, that you've been in your career for a number of years, is there any other profession that you think, oh, I wouldn't mind having to go with that? Um, I think, Emma, as you say, this is what I've, I've been brought up in. This is what I know. So probably to have looked and assessed for something different would have been very, very different and very alien, perhaps. I think that probably the side that was lacking on reflection was the career advice that we had at secondary school. It was very minimum and very much along the lines of teacher, nurse, police. So there wasn't any consideration of outside those boxes. Um, and I think in a way I probably fell into going to catering college through a friend that I worked with. Um, but in terms of doing something else, I don't know what I'd what I'd do. To be fair, this is this is what I know. This is what I love. This is what I get rewarded for doing. Um, so yeah, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. And besides, my family would go hungry if I didn't do this. <laughs> well, it's great to hear that you're still enjoying it anyway. Still very much the vocation. Um, that's great. And thanks so much to everybody for answering the questions. Um, we're going to wrap up in a minute. Just before I do, I just want to share my screen and just play our last um, last couple of slides just to um, show everyone what we've got in terms of resources. So we'll send a link out to this. We're doing so well on the tech. There we go. So um, just to say, so we will um, put the entire recording of this uh, webinar up on the Breaks YouTube channel. And you'll also find a selection of really fantastic webinars and other resources on that YouTube channel. So I really encourage you to check it out. And um, if you want, you can scan this QR code or you can visit the link. And again, we'll send this out. Um, and we've got um, we've got some more great resources for you to uh, for you to check out. So I think that Kylie gave a really great introduction uh, to the Fair Kitchens movement and explained a bit about some of the great uh, free resources that we have, including the leadership training. So we've got um, a, a PDF introduction again with a bit more information that you can access via this QR link or QR code or this link. Um, and we've also got a number of different websites that you can check out. So including um, articles from other women in the industry and advice, um, their advice for the next generation. Um, and also some, some really helpful uh, tools around communication. Um, so thank you everybody um, so much for joining us today. Um, and enjoy International Women's Day tomorrow. I think there's lots of really fantastic events on um, both virtually and in real life. And thanks again to Breaks, um, to Cathy, uh, to Fran for all of her support behind the scenes, and lastly to all of our fantastic speakers. Thank you all very much and have a great afternoon.